we're in this text today, and uh, it's a great one, but like I said, has some challenges with it. So with that in mind, let me pray for God's grace as we, as we move forward. And so I do pray for that as we've sung, Father, uh, we are so absolutely 100% reliant on your grace. Uh, everything comes by way of your grace, saving grace, um, grace for salvation, but also grace to help in times of need, sustaining grace, strengthening grace. And I also pray that by your grace, you would, by your spirit, open our eyes and our hearts to what you have for us today. There are things in this text that are going to challenge some of us and uh, will cause us to reflect on our lives personally, but also how we look at you and uh, consider you. So please rest heavy during this time as we gather under your word. This is your word. This isn't my word. This is your word to us. You are speaking by way of your word and you use people to proclaim. And so use me in spite of me by way of your spirit today, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as some of you know, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, he instituted two ordinances, sometimes referred to as observances or sacraments uh, that the church was called to observe. One of those was baptism, uh, as he famously said in what is referred to as the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go into all the nations and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's one ordinance or one sacrament or one observance. The second was communion, also referred to as the Lord's Supper, also referred to as the Eucharist, a fancy word that comes from a Greek word, Eucharistia, which simply means thanksgiving. It's a table of thanks. For those of you know, that know a little bit about the, the Greek language, you can hear uh, charis in there, where we get the word charis, charisma, charismatic, uh, eucharist. Uh, it's a table of grace. It's a table of, of thanks. This second ordinance was given, instituted on the night of his arrest during Passover. That's not a coincidence that Jesus instituted the communion meal during Passover was meant to take place. For the Passover was a yearly observance remembering the deliverance of God for the people of God from Egypt to the promised land and it was commemorated thereafter yearly through a Passover meal that had roasted lamb as a part of it, bitter herbs, as well, cups of wine and unleavened bread. And what Jesus did is he took that meal and turned it into a remembrance of uh, an even greater deliverance. When we eat his body and drink his blood, symbolically through the bread and the wine of communion, we remember the eternal freedom coming by way of the sacrifice of his body and the shedding of his blood. It reminds us of the cross, where Jesus, the Lamb of God, drank the cup of God's wrath, took on the bitterness of the world, and he freed us from sin, leaven of the world in our lives and the world around us. Now in Acts chapter two, some of you know this, but we read in Acts two that the early church was devoted to four things. Those four things, apostles' teaching, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching as well as fellowship, that word fellowship, uh, the word koinonia, keep that word in mind, koinonia, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now what most people believe is that the breaking of bread refers to meals where within them the communion meal was was observed. Uh, Jude writes about this, it seems, when he refers to love feasts. The closest we get to this day are maybe potlucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I've never been to a potluck where the communion meal was observed, but maybe something to think about. These were meals of fellowship. They were meals of joy. They were meals of care. They were meals of oneness with Jesus at the center. So what's the problem? 
as we go to our text because there always seems to be a problem with the Corinthian church. So what's the problem? Well, it shows up in verses 17 to 22. Let me read it for us. We read, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worst. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you. Okay, that's interesting. We'll come back to that. There must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, you know, so I was gonna carry on. What, period, right? What, exclamation, and that's that's appropriate. That's Holy Spirit inspired, what? What are you doing? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Like Paul has done in this letter, he's bringing the heat again. Um, He's not hesitant to do that. We'll double back on some things um, in this section of text that may be a little confusing in a moment, but I want you to notice the primary issue, and it's almost hard to believe. That when they came together, Paul highlights, the rich, those with means, we're bringing their beef tenderloin sandwiches, right, and their truffle salads, and their Chateau Rothschild bottles of wine, which I read this week, one sold for $310,000 in 2020, just in case you're wondering about maybe picking up a case of that. And what were they do? They, they weren't sharing with others, especially the poor uh, among them. On top of that, they're getting drunk. It's nuts. It makes sense that Paul starts verse 22 with, what? People are going hungry while others are gorging themselves and and getting drunk in the process. Again, it's hard to make this stuff up. In Acts chapter two, um, a text that I referred to earlier, just in terms of what the early church was devoted to, We read and are told in verses 44 and 45, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. That word common, koinos, a root of koinonia. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That's Acts chapter two. Fast forward a couple of chapters. In Acts four, we read this. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is extreme benevolence, but it marked the early church. But nothing like this, at least at this point, in the game with the Corinthians was taking place, only the opposite. No wonder Paul begins and he ends this section that I just read saying, I cannot commend you, obviously. Have you ever heard of someone saying, you probably uh, have uh, someone say something like, "We, we just need to get back to being a New Testament church? You ever read that, heard that? This is a New Testament church and I don't think we should follow their lead. Earlier in this letter, Paul, he refers to divisions in the church. We spent actually a couple of weeks looking at the divisions that came with the different camps, Paul camp, Apollos camp, Cephas camp, Christ only camp. The camps now, the divisions, the factions that he mentions here are between the haves and the have-nots. The rich and the poor, the fed and the hungry, that's a problem on its own. But it's an even greater issue when the purpose for coming together was to participate in the communion meal. A time meant to bring people together in love 
and care with Jesus at the center, with Jesus to be glorified. That's why Paul says, going back to our text, they humiliate those who have nothing. And they despise the church of God by way of what they're doing. No wonder he says in verse 17 that when you come together, it is not for the better, it's for the worst. Or worse, better than you just, that you just stayed home and didn't come at all. Now, before looking at Paul's response to all of this, and we'll get to that in verse 23, I want to double back to that verse that I paused on a little bit, verse 19, and consider what Paul means when he writes in verse 19, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Seems like a typo, doesn't it? There have been typos in Bibles over the years, by the way, believe it or not. Probably the most famous in the first run of the King James Bible back in the 1600s. King James commissioned the writing of a Bible in English. Street language, actually, believe it or not, when you read King James, the King James, that was street language. But it has some typos. It's early in the game. Typos, the most famous was in the, um, the leaving out of the word not in the command to not, thou shalt not commit adul- adultery. That's a whole other command if you keep not out of it. It seems like not here has been left out. It seems like it should read, for there must not be factions among you, but it says there must be factions among you. So what's Paul talking about? Well, I'll give you two, a two-part answer. One, genuine Christianity, and he says there must be factions to demonstrate who's genuine among you. Genuine Christianity is to look different, not only in the world, but in the church. And secondly, that genuineness isn't shown in the absence of issues within the church, but in how one responds to them when they show up. This is true for us personally. If you're married, you ever had an issue in your marriage? Families, issue with family members ever? Ever have an argument, a disagreement, not see the things the same way? Any other relationships with friends? Well, it's true in all of those, and it shouldn't be a surprise that it shows up in the church as well. We will have trials, we'll have tests, we'll have disagreements within the church that will demand some things from us, perseverance perhaps, courage perhaps, a willingness to make things right perhaps, humility perhaps, or on the flip side, just the opposite. Division, accusations, lack of forgiveness, perhaps at the first sign of trouble you just leave. Paul, it seems, is challenging his readers here to respond to this situation that's taking place in a way that demonstrates their genuineness. Their genuineness of their faith, but also the genuineness of their love for one another. So that's the problem. Verses 17 to 22 is the problem. Let's move from that to what Paul does next, and that is his response by reminding this church of the pattern of the Lord's Supper and the purpose behind the Lord's Supper. Let me read verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, We saw this language, by the way, when we looked at the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, when he delivered the gospel of first importance that Christ died for our sins. So this too has been delivered to Paul, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we have pattern here, we have purpose here. Let's begin with the pattern. 
on the night Jesus was betrayed, he first took bread. And I want you to note the historicity of this. This took place. There was a night that this took place in history. Thursday night, in an upper room, Jesus and the apostles. The night before the Friday in which Jesus was was killed, took bread. During the Passover meal, he gave thanks, he broke it, and and he said, this is my body which is for you. Let that sink in because there are no sweeter words. My body is broken for you. And and he did this while giving thanks. Our sweet Jesus. Our sweet, sweet Jesus. Did did Jesus die for the world? Yes. Unlimited atonement. Did Jesus die for the church? Yes. Limited atonement. Did Jesus die for you? Yes. Intimate (laughs) atonement. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And by this, as John writes in 1 John 3.16, we know love. We know love. We know what love looks like, that he laid down his life for us. But don't don't forget the second part of 1 John 3, 16, for it goes on to say, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So he begins this pattern by taking the bread. Secondly, in the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Not new in that it replaced anything, but knew in that it fulfilled everything. The the Passover was fulfilled with the Lord's Supper. The old covenant, as we know, had to be satisfied again and again and again, year after year after year with the shedding of blood of animals, all pointing ahead to Jesus and the new covenant who, who satisfied all things for all time with his blood. As the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, but now Jesus has appeared one time, just one time, at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself, and just as it is appointed for people to die, what I want, no no reincarnation, no coming back, to die once after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once, just once, it's finished work, fulfilled work, to bear the sins of many will appear a second time. Come, Lord Jesus, right? The way our world's going, man. Not to bear sin this time, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So that's the pattern. But Paul says it was delivered to him. How? Well, maybe the disciples who were there in the upper room told Paul about what took place in the upper room, or maybe by revelation of Jesus, as Paul writes about in Galatians chapter one. Either way, it doesn't really matter for for the sake of what we need to see. I want us to see the importance of this observance. It was delivered. It was delivered. It has its genesis with Jesus. This is a meal Jesus has given us. This wasn't something the apostles came up with. Jesus gave us this meal and he places high value on it for the church. So that's the pattern. But what's the purpose behind the Lord's Supper? 
I, I've taught on this before. Some of this may be a reminder uh, for some of you, but it's good to be reminded, especially on a, a meal <laughs> that calls us to remember. So let's be reminded this morning of some things regarding the purpose of this meal. One, it's to be a meal of remembrance. That's what it's probably best known for. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus says twice in verses 24 and 25. This is a memorial meal. It's a meal meant to look backward. It's a meal, however, that not only is to remember what Jesus did, what we could never do, what we deserve to do but could never do for our own sake, Jesus in our place instead. It's a meal that remembers that but remembers also and so importantly the implications of what he did for us now. As I've said a billion times over the years, we take time to remember Jesus every week by way of this meal because we forget Jesus every week. And we need to come back to Jesus and be reminded of what he has done for us and who we are in Christ. Secondly, it's a meal of association. Uh, This is a common meal. We are to eat this meal, I would argue, in community. With respect, I don't believe that this is a meal meant to be eaten alone or even a small with a small group of people this is a meal for the gathered people of god it's a meal we eat together when we come together as paul mentions in verses 33 and 34 and declare by our coming and our eating together that we stand with jesus that that's our foundation we all stand with jesus and by having this meal this common union meal in Jesus, with Jesus, with one another. We, we demonstrate to the world and we remind one another that we're no longer separated by class or race or nationality or gender or age. No factions, no divisions, because we're eating from the same bread and we're, we're drinking the same wine. So much of the Christian life is done alone. We have our quiet times alone. We have our morning devotions alone. We have times of solitude. And all of that is good. But this is not to be one of those things. This is to be a meal eaten with the assembly. And like the early church, we are to be devoted to it. Thirdly, it's a meal of proclamation. Verse 28, with this meal we proclaim the Lord's death. One of the criticisms I've had over the years of my preaching, and I've received my share of criticism, but one of the common criticisms that I've received over time is that when I preach, I don't preach the gospel enough. And when I ask what people usually mean by that. What they mean, for the most part, is I, I don't share the, what, what I would call or what they would call the four spiritual laws clearly enough. After, after I stop crying, I usually respond by, by saying that in my preaching, I always seek to bring people to Jesus in my preaching and that the gospel can be expressed in more than one way. So I respond that way, but additionally what I say most often is that we always take part in the communion meal when we gather every Sunday, and Jesus says, not me, Jesus says when we do, we proclaim something. We preach something. We herald something in vivid color color and imagery, and that something is his death. We proclaim it which means when we come forward and eat this meal together, there is never a gathering where the gospel isn't proclaimed. See, if you're an artist, you love this. Like if you see things in images, you love this. Because yes, things can be explained in words, but things can also be explained in theater. And every Sunday when you get up, like you're one day gonna get out of the grave, and you come forward and you eat this together, it's this beautiful theater of the gospel that Jesus 
died for us. He was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. And what do we do in response? We take Jesus. We sub- take the substance of Jesus. We ingest Jesus, abiding in Jesus. He did this. That's our only right response. Take him in. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Praise God, by the way, that the Bible isn't just made up of books that are like one another, like 66 epistles, right? That'd be a bummer. I love epistles. But that's not the Bible. The Bible is poetry and narrative. It's got apocalyptic literature that's just full of images and pictures. It's got gospels. It's got parables, it's got words, and it's got theater. And doing this, we proclaim the Lord's death, which leads, however, to the next thing this meal is all about, and that is celebration. We proclaim the Lord's death, don't miss it, until he comes. He's alive. We worship and remember a living Savior, and he's coming again, so we should celebrate This is a meal of remembrance, but it's not a meal, I would argue, meant to be eaten in sullenness. Yes, we should should come humbly, but not with sullenness. Jesus didn't call us to remember him with a fast, but a feast. He didn't, Call us to remember him with sackcloth and ashes. Although fasting has its place and there is a time for that too, but this is a celebration because he's alive and he's coming again. Next, it's a meal of participation. This is a little bit different than association and it takes us back to a message that Joshua, when he was here, preached where we read this in chapter 10. Paul writes, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation? Note that. That's the word koinonia. Fellowship. Communion. Association. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ, meaning what? This is not a mere meal of symbolism or simple observance. This is a meal of fellowship with one another and Jesus himself. Jesus gave us this meal and he is with us in this meal. We participate not only with each other but with him. You cannot overemphasize the glory of this feast. Jesus is here by way of his spirit through this meal he gave to feed us and fill us to declare to the world his death, his everlasting life, and his promised return. Next, what this meal is about with these first group of, of, of things this meal consists of kind of has a culmination. Let me show you what I mean. It's a meal of examination. Because of what I've said, we are to examine ourselves. Take a look at verses 27 to 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in the Lord, of the Lord, excuse me, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and and blood of the Lord. If you like underlining phrases, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Underline that. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Just stop there. The significance of this meal is shown by the results when it's eaten in an unworthy manner. If this meal was nothing, just something nice to do, this wouldn't make sense. 
It doesn't make sense. But Jesus says, this meal, Paul says, excuse me, says this, if we eat it in an unworthy manner, we're eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves. That we're, as I highlighted, we're guilty concerning the blood of the Lord and the body of the Lord. How, how do you eat the meal, this meal, in an unworthy manner? Because that should be the question we are all yelling internally right now. Right? Okay, help me make sure that's not me. There's only one way. There's only one way to eat the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and that is with unrepentance in our hearts. Why is that? Because this is a meal of grace. And it's a meal of remembrance of Jesus' finished work. And therefore, our worthiness to eat this meal never comes by way of our work, but his. We, we don't eat this meal because we had a great week. Five out of seven days, we had devotions. Right? We were really nice to each other in our, in our home. We didn't get in a fight with our spouse on the way to church. Right, you feel great. I'm worthy. That doesn't make you worthy, me worthy to eat this meal. We eat this meal because it's a meal we're invited to eat and it's freely given. One of my favorite passages uh, in the Bible is found in Isaiah 55. Just, just listen to the invitation. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Here's a question. How, how do you buy something if you have no money? Seems kind of cruel. Invi invitate, come, buy. You have no money, come and buy. The only answer is that someone else paid for it. And that's what this meal is. You, you don't come to this table because you paid for it. You come to this table because someone else paid for it in your place. So you're invited to come. It's a table of grace. Come, unless there's unrepentance in your heart. If you're eating this meal with an unrepentant heart, you're eating in an unworthy manner. And in the context of our passage, if you're eating this meal while disregarding your brothers and sisters in Christ and you're getting drunk and you're eating all the food, keeping it to yourself, others are going hungry, you're despising the church, you're treating others horribly, you're drinking and eating judgment upon yourself with every sip and every bite. Although the context isn't communion, the idea is the same when Jesus says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you or perhaps you have something against your brother and sister, go, leave your gift there. Like, leave it. Go and make things right and then come back and offer your gift. How important is our unity and fellowship? Well, Jesus would rather have unity and fellowship than even worship and our giving. That's how important it is. Leave your gift. Stop what you're doing. Go and make it right. Do, deal with the heart stuff. Deal with the relationship stuff. And then come back. And so what Paul says, look, if, if this is the possibility, before you drink and before you eat, examine yourselves. This is also why this is a meal for Christians only. For there is no greater way to eat this meal in an unworthy manner to, than to eat it while not being in Christ and he in you. In other words, there's been no repentance. You're living a life of unrepentance until you come to Christ. 
What, what is repentance? Repentance is not feeling simply sorry for our sins. Repentance is turning from them. Our city is full of people, as I've talked about, who are sorry for their sins. They have repented from them and turned to Jesus. That's why um, oftentimes when we talk about church discipline, it's associated with a big word, excommunication. The word excommunication literally means without communion. Because you come to somebody by yourself and you point something out, out and they say, no, I'm not listening to you. You bring two or three people with you, you point out and say, no, I'm not listening to you. You bring the whole church, point it out and say, no, I'm not listening to you. Excommunication, no longer communion. Why? You're not repentant. And you're gonna eat and drink judgment upon yourself. This is also what I would say to you parents. I don't want to scare you parents. I just want to give you some pastoral old man funk advice and just say that if, if you have children that you've walked through this with them, there are some churches that won't allow anybody to partake in this meal unless they're baptized. We, we don't do that here, but I get it. I totally get it because this means the same thing as baptism. And so if you're feeling like you can partake in this then, and you haven't been baptized, be baptized. And if you've been baptized, partake in this. Uh, one of the things I encourage parents to think about as you journey through things with your children and, and you have the best sense of where they are spiritually is to sit down and talk about this, to take these decisions soberly and not say, you know what, you're ready to take this, but hey, let's hold off for a while on the whole baptism thing. I, I, I encourage you to walk through this with your kids um, because of the soberness and the seriousness and the sweetness too uh, of this meal. But this leads next, this examination and, uh, uh, and the call of it um, to something else that this meal is about and that it, it's a meal of invitation too. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. John 6, 51. A chapter later, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You see, this is just food and drink. There's nothing special about the symbols of bread, wine. The wine's terrible, by the way. None of you would buy it and eat in your meals, right? We go cheap here because you're dipping bread into it. Nothing significant about these symbols, but as I've said recently, allow the ordinary of it to point to the extraordinary of it, and that's the person and work of Jesus. And with each eating comes an invitation for those not in Christ to come to Jesus in repentance and, and to eat and drink too, to be filled with Christ and be seated at his table. And for those of you in Christ, but upon examination, you see that there is something that needs to be made right, make it right, and when it is, come and eat too, because it's a meal of invitation, it's a meal of grace, it's a meal of sustenance. That's why every Sunday when we gather, we have a time of repentance and, ass and assurance. And is there danger of that becoming formulaic and redundant? Sure, but that's not on the church. That's on you and your preparation. Preparing your hearts when you come to gather. So even if you've had that kind of week, you're reminded at the very least, because this is the role of the church and the assembly of it, you're reminded of the sweetness of the grace of Jesus. That there's grace for you. Repent of, repent and come and receive grace upon grace and, and re be reminded of the assurance that is ours in Christ. Lastly, it's a meal of anticipation. This meal looks backward. This meal calls us to look inward. And this meal looks forward. He's coming again. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, this meal is a literal foretaste of a time to come. So where are we with the couple minutes that I have left? Well, we've looked at the problem, and in response, Paul 
has reminded us of the pattern of the Lord's Supper and the purpose behind it, we'll begin wrapping up by looking at the penalty, which introduces us to some verses that will challenge at least some of you. Let me read verses 30 to 32. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. (laughs) Not some. Many. Like, what is going on in this church? That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. What what is this? Well, I'll, I'll sum it up this way. God takes our sins seriously. And especially, it seems, our sin towards one another and his church. I don't know how you conclude any, can conclude anything differently. And the call is, we're to take our sin seriously. And to not presume upon the kindness of God. Because kindness is meant to lead to repentance. Grace, kindness leads to repentance, not sin. And the call here is to examine ourselves. Paul uses exam and he also uses the word judge to judge ourselves and rid ourselves and the body of anything dishonoring. In verse 29, Paul writes that if we're not to eat and drink, that we're not to eat and drink without discerning the body, he says. What's the body here? Well, the body is certainly the body of Christ, but it's also like the physical body of Christ, but it's also the body of Christ the church and our our bodies as a part of it. And the warning here, and I I know this is hard for some of us to hear, the warning here is that if we don't examine ourselves, if we don't judge ourselves, God will. That's what Paul means here. And how does the judgment come? Sickness and death. Think Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5. What, what do we do with this? Because it's really sobering. Well, let me give you three responses very quickly. Number one, we should not conclude that all sickness is the result of personal sin. Okay, we should not conclude that. All sickness ultimately is because of sin, because we live in a sin-ravaged cosmos, and one of the fallenness depictions of it is is sickness, but not all sickness is the result of personal sin. I want to be very, very clear about that. Secondly, coming out of that, however, is this should move us to take seriously our sin, for God certainly does. And three, and this is going to be a stretch for some of you, in your understanding of God, We must see the sickness here not as a punishment, but discipline. As Paul writes in verse 32, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. God no longer punishes Christians because Jesus has been punished already in our place. But he does discipline He does discipline. Here's my primary takeaway from all of this. God God sends individual discipline. Uh, The word that is uh, properly used here is chastening to push believers back towards righteous behavior and sends death to some in the church to encourage those who remain to choose holiness rather than sin. As one writer puts it, 
Even if the Lord were to strike us dead for profaning his table, it would be to discipline us to keep us from being condemned. The thought is powerful. We are kept from condemnation. Why is that? For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By divine intervention, God chastens us to keep us from falling from salvation and will even take our life if need be before that could happen. Sobering. Right? But not surprising. For, for like a good father, our heavenly father disciplines those he loves. And he loves us so much that he will go so far as to save us from ourselves by taking our lives from us, if need be. He is also dedicated to the glory of his name and the glory of the bride of Christ that is the church. If if this sounds over the top to you, my encouragement is to not confuse our often lackluster view of personal holiness with how God views it. And my, my encouragement to you as well is to not confuse our often lackluster view of our fellowship with one another with how God views that. We are, we are to be people of holiness. For our God is a holy God. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, Norm, I agree with that. But our holiness and our blamelessness ultimately comes from Jesus. And I say yes and amen a thousand times to that but we are to walk thereafter in a manner worthy of what has been freely given to us in Christ. We are to be holy and blameless people because we are holy and blameless people in Christ. And and when we examine ourselves and we see those things that are not, we repent and we turn from them and we come and eat for the glory of his name and for the sake of the body. So that's the problem That's the pattern, that's the purpose, that's the penalty. I will close with the plan going forward and it's a very simple, sweet plan. Look at the last two verses of chapter 11. So then, my brothers and sisters of Midtown, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Pretty straightforward plan. Really simple. Stop doing what you're doing. Turn back, consider one another, and come and eat together. And so with all of that said, and as we now move into a time of response, I invite you to this table. After examining yourself, come. Hear his invitation and come, eat and drink this meal that is free for us because Jesus paid for it all, come and let's proclaim together Jesus' death until he comes again. Would you rise as we respond? I want to lead us into response. Obviously, I don't need to explain what this meal is. I've just done that for the last hour and a half. It's not really, it may feel like it. But I want to invite us by something that we read in, in Psalm 32. I take us here because there's an overlap, I think, with our text. So I'm going to read this and then come when you're ready. We have people down below that would love to pray with you. Take advantage of that. Ben is going to lead us in worship. I'll come up after and close our time. But listen to the words of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, to which we say, amen. Whose sin is covered, blessed is the man, woman, against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Does that not resonate with some of us? Where we're just living perhaps in secret sin, unrepented sin, and you just feel sick.
sick almost. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. It goes on to say, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So after examining, come up and let's remember the death of Jesus together.